just bless you. We honor you. We thank you. We welcome you this morning to this place, Father. May he, the Holy Spirit, may he come in. May he speak to our hearts. May he rule us. May he draw us close to your side, Father. I pray this day that all this said and done and to bring glory, bring honor to your name. I, I pray this morning for those who have lost their desire or their zeal. Their zeal for you, Father, I pray you would stir their hearts this morning. For those that don't know you, may they open their hearts to you and receive you as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray for those this morning. Those that are sick and suffering. Those that are afflicted in their bodies. Father, I pray you touch them. Bring glory and honor to your own self. And all that's going to be said and all that's going to be done in them. We love you. We bless you. Now we welcome you in this place. And to the strong and mighty name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I think maybe Brother Steve's going to come and lead us on a, a special this morning. You might be seated. <laughs> Let us uh, worship as Brother Steve comes. see too often as we carry through. You know, uh, I believe in angels, and I believe they interact with us in our lives. Some people don't, but if you read the Bible, they are biblical. And, you know, they, they've shown many times, but I still think they do work. But I also think that we're angels, in a way. And I feel like when, when God puts a person in your thoughts, there's a reason. And we don't know how many times that someone passes through our thoughts and maybe they're struggling. Maybe they just need a kind word. We don't know where they might be at in life. And so often we drop the ball on that. I know I do. But I've tried to get better, to, I've tried to get better about that um, because I, next thing you know, three or four days went by. And whatever that moment could have been has passed. But we can do God's work. And sometimes it just takes a kind word. So this, this isn't really a Christmas song, but to me it always reminds me of Christmas. Go ahead, Chris. I was walking home from school on a cold winter day. Took a shortcut through the woods, but somehow I lost my way. It was getting late, and I was scared and all alone. But then a kind old man took my hand and led me home. And Mama couldn't see him. Oh, but he was standing there And I knew in my heart He was the answer to my prayers Oh, I believe there are angels among us Sent down to us from somewhere up above Show us how to live, to teach us how to give, to guide us with the light of love. When life's held trouble times that had me down on my knees, there's always been someone to come along and comfort me. Kind word from a stranger to lend a helping hand. A phone call from a friend just to say I understand. Now, ain't it kind of funny at the dark end of the road? Someone likes a ray with just a little stray of hope. Show. 
Santa Claus, but we knew they was not going to put anything under the tree, and we would not get anything until we went to bed. About 12, 12.05, I woke up, and I got up, and I thought it was early enough for me to open presents, so <laughs> Daddy got up. <laughs> uh, Daddy run me back to bed. He said, it ain't Christmas Day yet. You go to bed. I thought he was going to kill me out me and my brother, but... It's always, it's always has, always has been an exciting time when we celebrate the first event, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your Bibles and you want to read along with us, we're going to be reading from 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'll just read a couple of verses there. 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'll read verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. God bless the reading of his word. You might be seated. The promise of his coming. We read about the, the first event of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we read it in the Christmas story every year. And this has been a bit of an unusual, a strange season for me and somewhat. And the fact that we have not been to Christmas plays, had Christmas programs, had the little children send speeches. Even our families have not celebrated together like we would normally celebrate. My family... My wife was talking to me just a couple of days ago, and she says, uh, what have we done as a family, with your family, with my family, at Christmas, that we could start a tradition with our own children? And as I begin to think about that, when every year at Christmas Eve, we would always, we always have gathered with mom and dad at their home, and as we would eat supper together, we would finish, we would go to the front room, and everyone would find a place, and we would sing a song or two, my brother would get the guitar and we would all sing and mama would sing a song or two and daddy he, my dad he's the kind of person he'd like to start a song and leave it to my mama to finish it. <laughs> and so we would do those kind of things and and you you probably recognize this, some families are just snotters. 
Meaning they get together to get to talking about loving one another and about how much God loves them. All of a sudden they're, they're sniffing and the snot and they're crying and carrying on. Anybody recognize that at their house and their family? Well, we would do some of that. But this year, it was not quite the same. Not that we did not get together, but can you imagine wearing masks to a family gathering? I would have never thought it in all my days. But that's the times we're living in. But can I tell you this morning... There's a promise of a coming again, the second advent. Sister Pat, I don't have to wear a mask when I get there. Amen. Amen. I'm about done with this stuff anyway, but until it's fully, really finished and done, I think it's going to be when we get to glory. When the second advent happens and he comes again without sin on the salvation to receive the church unto himself. And so if we look at this passage this morning, I want to think about the promise of his coming. The truth which which uh, it turned on the, the scoffers. They kind of turned them on. And it led them into irreligious and self-indulgence. They, they, they did not recognize Christ. They ignored him. They, matter of fact, they mocked, they scoffed. They said, where is his coming? All things continue. You know, like it's always been since my father fell asleep. Nothing's really changed. I don't see his coming. But just because we may not see his coming does not mean or does not hinder the second advent, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to receive the church <coughs> unto himself. It's the same truth which was embodied in the ancient Proverbs. Uh, it's always said, it always has been said, the Lord is coming again. I've heard that all my life. I believe that. Some days I have a stronger urge, a stronger feeling for it than I did maybe days past. But as I pause and I look to how strange life has become, and we have to all agree on this, as strange as life has become, does it not cause our hearts to look towards the sky and wonder, is this the day that he may come? If he don't come, then I'm, I'm definitely going to have to eventually go. But I'm also convinced in my heart and my spirit this morning that I will be walking around when the rapture of the church takes place. I'm just convinced of that. Now, that could be different. God may work it another way, but I just feel that in my heart, in you know, my spirit. And so there's a couple of things I want us to look at this morning as we look at these couple of verses. First of all, let's think about the meaning of the promise. Now, Christ, he was on that day, he says in John chapter 14, he said he was going to go away. And if he went away, he would not leave us comforters. He'd pray to the Father and he'd send another comforter. But he would go and he was uh, going to prepare a place for us. And if he went away, he'd come again. And he would receive us unto himself. He has promised us that. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ promise that, but many of the writers, many of the apostles, many of those men, that holy men of old, they, they pinned down the word of God and they, they, are, they were convinced and they wrote it, they penned it, that Christ would come again and he would receive the church. Now, it is held by the whole church. And I think the church, the true church. Now, I'm not talking about religions. But I'm talking about the church of the living God. Those who have believed in their heart and confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe we as Christians, I believe the church is looking for the Lord to come again. Now all churches and all religions may not be looking, but I believe the church is really looking for the Lord. And, and as I think about that, that's enough right there for me. As we hold that as a whole. I mean, when I think about it, you all understand this. How hard is it to get a group, no bigger than our group is today, how hard is it to get them to agree on one particular item and be 100% on one item? I mean, it's kind of hard sometimes just me and Miss Jerry when we're trying to decide what we want to eat. She wants to, she's naming out things that, that she could eat and she's naming them out. I don't want to eat it. So if two people sometimes it's hard to get there together, you can imagine how many, how hard it is when more, most of us get together, but it's held amongst believers that we believe the Lord is soon to come. And it is a sincere belief in the first advent. We all celebrated that. Every one of us celebrated that this, this week. Did we not? In many of our homes, in many of our yards, we have the nativity scenes, right? Anybody got a nativity scene at their house? We got one on our counter. It's a little small one. But we've got the nativity scene there, and there's probably some things in there that was not really there on that day, but that's not here nor there. I'm not going to speak, preach about that today. 
But what I want us to understand is we all, do we not all believe that Jesus was born in the little town of Bethlehem? Born to a virgin, her name was Mary. How many of us believe that this morning? And so we all believe as believers in Christ, as Christians, we believe in the first advent that Christ came. Now, we all hold that of the event of God's Son. And, but it also, when we look at that, it also leads us to believe in the second event, advent. When he was, he was judged, he was sentenced, he was crucified, they took him down, they buried him in a cross, uh, in an empty tomb, and on the third day morning he arose, he walked amongst us somewhere around 40 years, he went to the Mount of Olives, he was called away, and just as much as we believe that and read that and understand that, we're looking for him to come again a second time, are we not? Under sin under salvation. So now, so it's very clear cut in itself the promise of Christ and his second coming. Because Christ himself has already quoted and made mention there in John 14. He said, if I go away, he said, I will come again. We know he went to the Mount of Olives. He was taken away. And we understand and we believe that he is going to come again. So it's clear cut for me about the promise. And so Christ himself had made this promise to us. And as I think about that, it was a promise that it's going to be fulfilled just because it has not yet been fulfilled does not mean it will not be fulfilled. Now, this is apparent from the different views that are, that are amongst people. When I think about it all through the period of history, many people have different views and opinions about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of times folks want to get hung up on the fact that they don't know when he's coming. Well, can I tell you this morning? And it is important when he comes, but for me, first and foremost, it's not important when he's coming. What is important to me is that he is going to come again. Amen. And, and too many people, they want to put a, a date and a time and a period. Can I tell you, if anybody tells you when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming and pinpoints this to a day, they are false prophets. Because the word of God teaches us no man knows the day or the hour. Now we can understand the seasoning and we can understand the coming is nigh us. But we cannot pinpoint it what day, what hour, or even what week or month it may take place. Or even maybe what year it may take place. Now how and when Christ shall come, there are matters of great importance to us and great interest. But the very fact that he's coming is the greatest interest to me. Second thing I want us to notice is this. Think about the giver of the promise. The value of this promise is in who it was given by. Christ himself gave us this promise. Now, when people are giving things, and I may mention it just a couple weeks ago, if I give you a letter and I have signed it, on my belief, on my opinion, or whatever it may be, can I tell you, it's probably no more valuable. Matter of fact, it isn't even value, worth the value of what the paper initially was. Because my name and my signature and my words don't mean anything. But now, if you had a document that was signed by a former president, if you had a baseball card that was signed by the original Babe Ruth, who knows what that would be worth today? Amen? So it, there's value, but there's value in whom the promise was given by. See, I can promise you all day that the Lord's going to soon come and he's going to receive us. And that don't really stand for a whole lot. But when we read it in the word of God and Christ and his apostles, and they said it matters and it means much. And even in the midst of that, even the Holy Spirit, he confirms it when we say those things. When we think about the value of any promise, it depends upon the character of him who it has been given by. And not only upon his character, but also his ability and also his resources. When I think about the character of Christ, Christ, he became sin for us. And he redeemed us. He became sin who knew no sin. And he died for us. So when I think about him, when I think about his character, he is of the utmost and highest character that we can even find amongst any man or any woman. Not only upon his character, but also what about his ability? He 
his ability to follow through with whatever he promised. Y'all have heard me, and I've talked about this multiple times when I first got here, about getting so happy one day, I'm just going to jump across this podium and turn out and land in the middle of the floor and say, voila, it ain't happened yet. You reckon why? I, good thing I didn't promise you I was going to do that because I would be a liar. It's okay to agree with me. And so here, when I promise things, it's, and it's kind of like we promise we're going to do such and such on such and such a day, and this is what we would do. And sometimes things hinder us, and we don't have the ability or capable of doing those things. But notice now, when we think about the ability of Christ, Christ is able to perform because he has all the resources that he would ever need to perform the duty that he promised he would do. Now, the voice has been that of the Son of God. When we read it in, in, in John 14, that's the voice of God's Son. God has always said, He's going to go away and He's going to come again. He's going to receive. He's always been saying that. And it's also been said and by the inspired prophets and the apostles. Because when I read Peter here, if you'll go back to 1 Peter and you'll start reading it, and this is Paul just for a minute. If you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. I just want to show you something. Going back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Start off, he says, in very, the very first word, verse, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and notice who he's addressing it to, to the pilgrims. To the pilgrims. You know, he, he's talking to us. What does that mean? We are pilgrims and strangers in this place. This is not our home. What that means is he's going to come again and he's going to receive us and take us to our home. All through 1 Peter, all through 2 Peter, he continually relates to the second event when he's going to come and receive us unto himself. And so Peter, here he is, he's inspired by the Holy I want you to challenge you and I want you to go home and spend time maybe sometime this week and read First and Second Peter and see how many times he mentions about Christ coming again in some form or some fashion or us joining with him. Challenge you to do that. And the reason I'm challenging because not only did Christ say it was going to happen, the apostles, inspired by the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit, pinned these things down. And can I tell you, the word of God says, before one jot or one tiller would fail, heaven and earth would pass away. Amen? Amen? And so if the apostles said it, and if Christ said it, it's going to happen. And so we can base it on the fact of the one that has promised it. What about the delay? What about the delay in the fulfillment of the promise? There has, been, there has been a constant coming of this second event. From the day he went to the Mount of Olives and he was taken away, there's been a constant return. He hasn't returned yet. It's been over 2,000 years and we're still looking. But there has been a constant movement to, towards, towards his return. No doubt, there's been a constant coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's done it through and by his spirit. And here's what I'm sensing in my spirit. The closer it comes, and you may have, this may have resonated in your heart, the closer the coming of the Lord gets, the more we feel it rise in our spirit, and we feel it's just before that he will come, he will split the eastern sky. We sense that in our spirit as believers in Christ. But now... If a man does not recognize or believe Christ, has never received and acknowledged the fact that Jesus came, he died and paid for our sin, and we believe that and confess it, whatever. If a man has never done that, this has not resonated in his heart, and he's not yet looking for Christ because he has not yet believed in the Christ. Both, he's coming both in judgment, and he's also coming in rebuke. And also, he's coming in mercy, and he's coming in the deliverance. And for us, the saints of God, he's coming most definitely with mercy. And he's coming with deliverance. He's going to deliver us from all this we're in. You know, I, 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 I said this some time back. We don't hardly know from one week to the next what worship is going to look like. But can I tell you, and I can't even imagine, but when we get to glory, we won't have to wear masks. We won't be a strain. We can come around the throne of God and we can worship and we can praise him like he deserves. I believe that. 
If the early Christians were in some kind of instant, impatient because of their hope that was growing inside of them, and that's what they were because when, when, when Peter was writing this, Peter was looking as though the Lord was going to come in any moment. Well, now, can you see 2,000 years later and the Lord still hadn't come? And if it was burning in his heart like that, how much more ought it to be burning in the saint of God's heart today, knowing that he could come at any moment and any time? Because as I read and I study and I understand the word of God, there is nothing else needs to happen on the universe, in this planet, around us, in us, or through us, except him coming. Everything's been done, already been done. What wonder is now and again, and we think about the examples in time, the, the, the depression and the times of persecution and the hearts of faithlessness. When I think about all the things and how, how we have wandered away from God, we live in a time where I sense even the church is wandering away from God. Even the church itself acts as though that Christ is not soon to come. Amen. Sometime back I was speaking with some pastors and that com comment come up in the conversation and the expression and the looks on some of their faces that it would even be mentioned about the second coming of the Lord it almost seemed to terrify them. I'll be the first one to tell you, all I've ever known is flesh and blood. And I feel myself to be healthy this morning, and I'm not trying to rush myself out of this life into the next one. That's not what I'm doing. Because I want to hold on as long as I can. Isn't that what we're, our bodies, our minds, that's what we want to do. We want to live. As, do we not want to live? Sure we do, and I can understand that. But at the same time, we should understand the promises in his word. He's going to come again, and we should be anticipating. We should look, and it should be building our hope and our anticipation. It should build every time we come together. Amen. He didn't come this past week. He might come next week. He don't come next week. Well, he might come the next week. We have become so attuned to not even looking for him. And when someone says he may come, it bothers us. You know, there's going to be a day when he will appear. And it should be in our hearts. There should be a fervent prayer. And I recognize there is not a fervent prayer in the heart of the church today. Come, Lord Jesus, come. I recognize that. Because I'll be the first one to tell you, I've done told you, I'm still in the flesh. And for me to get serious and pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. That's a strain and a struggle. Well, that's what we ought to be doing, praying. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Can I tell you? He has promised us. He's coming again. Whether we pray or not, he's still going to come. Y'all remember some time ago I told you I had bought a lottery ticket? And then I was afraid and I, I, I didn't want to win. I started praying, Lord, don't let me win. Well, you, I ain't had that problem no more. Some people, I think, as Christians, they're praying, Lord, don't come yet. There's some, and I'll be the first one to tell you, as a man, as a human, there's some places I'd still like to go. There's some things I'd still like to do. But can I tell you, I'm still looking for the Lord to come. Amen. One of my trips that I've always wanted to do, I want to do an Alaskan cruise. I want to do a Hawaiian cruise. And I don't have money to do either one of them. But if the Lord would have blessed me to go do either one of them, and if he come in the middle of it, it'd be all right with me. Amen. See, because it ain't about the cruise. It's about where have I am at. I'm ready for him. Amen? Can we be surprised if it has something, if something hadn't been lost over time? I, and I know it has been lost. There's things that have been lost amongst us as the church. Matter of fact, a lot of times we forget this fact. We forget the fact that, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. We forget that. Meaning, for my lifetime, for, for what little bit of 61 years I've lived, man, that, that seemed like a long time. But in, in the mind and the heart of God, that's kind of like a blink of an eye, maybe. Can I tell you, sometimes we forget that. 
And we think that we ought to just live here forever. But it ain't going to be that way. There's going to come a day that if we don't go, he's going to come. And he's going to receive us. But there's a fourth thing I want us to notice. The abuse of this delay. And it's abused by the mockery and the scoffers. And what they're saying is, where is this promise? Can I tell you the world makes fun of us? They mock, they scoff, they tell us that we say we believe that Jesus died for our sins. We believe he's gone away and he's prepared us a place and he's going to come again. They mock, they, they mock us from the first such person that has ever asked that question. Where is the promise? Unbelief has taken form in ridicule. I don't understand this, that the church has been ridiculed. I understand that because it didn't come from the church itself. But where it's coming from is from Satan himself. Amen. Satan, is, Satan knows that Christ is going to come again. He knows that. But what he does, he speaks to us and he tells us, he ain't going to really come. He really don't care about you. Can I tell you, I don't care how you feel as a man or a woman. He does care. He loves you. He's going away. He's going to come again and receive us. Right. Satan would have us. To doubt those facts. And I tell you this morning, this one occasion, there has been more scoffers. There has been more scoffers about it. But faith itself, faith in his second returns, faith in his second event, it rests on his first event. As much as we celebrated Christmas and the first event, the virgin birth, as much as we celebrated that, we ought to even more so celebrate the fact that he's coming again. Help you understand that. Churches, year after year after year, have Christmas programs, and every one of them, do they not have a little baby in a manger? If you didn't have a baby in a manger, you didn't have a Christmas program. We sing away in the manger, little star in Bethlehem. We sing all those songs, and it's all related to his first event. When, may I, when are we going to ever start having services celebrating his second event? Yeah. Hallelujah, matter of fact, we ought to have one this morning. Yeah. And when we go home, when we get with our family, we ought to have another celebration. He's coming again. Next Sunday morning, we're going to have another celebration. Every time we as believers of God, we are to get together. We are to celebrate the fact he's going to come again. Amen? Amen. Amen. But we don't do that. So let me ask you the question. Do we really believe he's coming again? We say it and we get, I believe he's coming again. We say it good. We say it strong. We say it passionate. But do we really believe the Lord is soon to come? I'm convinced if we, the people of God, really believe that he's going to come again, I think we would live like he was going to come again. Can I tell you, people will lie, they're cuss, they're swear, they're cheat, they will be ungodly and come to the house of God on Sunday and think God's going to just accept that. Can I tell you, God don't accept our mess. He accepts true, genuine worship that stems out of our hearts. And how can true worship stem out of our heart if we've not had a relationship with him during the week? How can it happen? So he's coming. Even worse than the fear of judgment there's so many that has just cast him off we're living in a time where in the, in the church world the church is starting to cast him off when Christ is not invited and Christ is not part of any service we have we ought not have it Amen. it don't matter if it's a singing it's a prayer meeting 
If it's Bible study, if it's revival, it don't matter what we come together. If we come to join a couple together in holy matrimony, if we have a funeral sir, it don't matter what we come together for. If we don't exalt the Savior in the midst, why do we even bother to come? Amen. He should be invited, and he should be worshipped. I understand one of our former members passed in the last six or seven days. Patsy Stone. When I think about that, when I would send out a post, she would shoot me some kind of three or four times. Man, she would just preach Brother Randy or Pastor Randy, good, good to see you, or tell everybody hello. She was always responding. She was always engaging. I would trust that when they have my last, I don't think they're going to have a going away service for me. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for the rapture of the Lord to take place. But just in case, Miss Jerry already understands how to go ahead and have revival. Celebrate the Christ. He's going to come again. He's going to receive us all. And Brother Randy's going to rise first, and then we're going to join him. That's what I want us to do together. So the scoffers, they have flown aside every resistance. You know what? The scoffers, they, they don't even believe in the Christ. They don't believe he's going away. They don't believe he's coming again, and they mock us. Can I tell you, it don't matter if they are out there. He's still going to come. They have refused to even check their own selves. When we, as a church, begin to fling aside, and we will not check ourselves. We are selling aside all the resistance and we don't check ourselves. We have abandoned our own selves and we have abandoned him and we have indulged in a carnal lust. A carnal worldly minded lust. I understand we want to live and be as old as we can be but I also want to spend eternity in the presence of God. Amen. A fifth thing I'll mention to us, the power and the inspiration of this promise. See, when I start talking about the coming again of the Lord, and I, and I would love to have a dollar for every time I stood in this room and I have quoted part, or the part, part of the scripture where it says, the dead in Christ will rise first. And we which are alive and remain will be called up, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I would love to have a dollar for that. I, I know, who knows how much money I'd have, reckon? That ain't the point how much money I have. I just want you to understand, I look forward to the coming of the Lord. And if he don't come and take me out of this world, he's going to come and receive me unto himself. It's going one way, one way or the other. Death or life, I'm still going to go into his presence. So then let's think just for a few moments about the power and the inspiration of this promise. It is, it is working in both the scoffer and the Christian. Now, that which to one is an occasion to scoff. So when, I, when we read that, the scoffer, he's going to mock, and he's going to like, well, he ain't never coming. I don't see him coming. I don't think he ever like someone. He ain't never. They're going to scoff. They're going to mock that. But when we, the saint of God, when we hear that, we're looking to the sky. We're listening, we're listening for a trumpet to sound. We're expecting. We're excited about that. See, both of us, there is an inspiration. There's power in that for both of us, for the scoffer, it just helps him to walk further away from God. But for the Christian, it causes him to draw even nigher to God. <clears throat> Faith rests upon the first again, as I have already said. Hope, it stretches forth its hand. And that's what we're doing. We're hoping. And when I say I'm hoping for the second coming of the Lord, I'm not hoping as though it might not happen. When I say I am hoping for the second event, what I'm saying it is an expectation in my heart. He's going to come again, and I'm just, well, it might, it might not. No, no, no. They know might or might not about it. He's going to come again to receive us and himself. There may be mention 
amongst these fruits of the blessed promises. What are they? Patience. Well, what, what a fruit to have. Patience. Patiently waiting on the second coming. The world is falling apart. Nobody seems to care. But I love you, Lord, and I'm going to patiently wait on you. I'm not going to become impatient. Not only patience. What about endurance? When you keep hearing all the criticism, when you hear and see people rejected, you continually to endure. I know he's going to come. I know he didn't come last week, but I'm looking for him to come next week. Enduring. Enduring hardships. Enduring the sufferings. Because we know all these things, they are only, they are only temporary. Faithful. Fulfillment. We are as his servants and his stewards. And we are being faithful because he has appointed a day and a time that he will come again. And then what we're doing is we're making preparation for his second advent. I do understand when the rapture takes place, those who have not received Christ will be left. So my question to us is this. If the second advent was to take place, Christ was to come and he was to stop in the midair, and we were to be called up, would anybody miss you? Would anybody miss you? Would anybody recognize that Randy Locklear had left? Would anybody miss that you has left? Or are you certain that you would be the one going up? Those are things we need to be certain about. We're ready. If he was to come, we'd go with him. We need to be Quiet and disregard all that any scoffer might say. Their mockeries and their unbelief, we should never ever allow him to deter us. Amen. You know, it's so easy for us to become discouraged and frustrated. Y'all don't believe that, do you? Has anybody experienced frustration over the last 10 months? Yes? And some of us may be sitting here this morning and we're dealing with frustration. Can I tell you, it don't matter what's going on around us or what the scoffer and the mocker, the unbeliever may say. I'm telling you, Christ is coming again. Amen. Are you ready? Father, we thank you as we have celebrated over this past week, over this past month, as we have decorated our church buildings, we have decorated our homes. Some of us have even decorated ourselves, Lord, with Christmas colors. We have celebrated, some of us, knowingly, the first event. Some of us have done some type of celebration, not so much because of the Christ's birth, but they celebrated in giving and receiving of gifts. But Lord, none of those things seem to matter much if we've not made preparation for the second event. So today, Father, I pray that if anyone is listening to our voice and they don't know you, Lord, they've never made preparation for your return again, Lord, that this may be the day, this may be the hour they make preparation for you, Lord. Lord, you promised us you was going to go away and you was going to come again. And so, Father, my heart longs to see you. I'm looking for you, Lord. Lord, but somebody may not be ready. 
So, Father, I pray you'll call them, you'll woo them to your side this day that they may make preparation. And, Father, as we come together, as often as we do, until you shall come, let us be celebrating the second advent. You're going to come again, and we are awaiting your arrival. We bless you. We love you. These things we ask in the strong and mighty name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. As we stand together this morning, maybe this is a day that you will, you will begin to practice. And not just practice it, let it become a vital part of every day of your life, celebrating the second event that it could be taking place before the sun goes down here today. Stand with me this morning as we sing how great thou art. The altar is open to you. If you have a desire, you may find your place in the altar. My God, when I was a wonder, consider
Father, we bless you. We love you, God. We thank you for who you are and what you mean to us. Thank you for life, health, for hope. Thank you, Lord, that we are anticipating your second event. You are going to soon come and you're going to receive on Sunday. You say, thank you, Father. We bless you. We love you. We adore you because we know, Father, this morning that we will escape hell. We will escape damnation. We will escape all of that that the Satan has thrown at us. Father, we bless you. We honor you. We love you. We thank us now that you go with us and you direct us. You stand by us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we close today,